Well, you're in for a treat besides my terrible throat, which started to hurt just last night. The panel is dynamic and encouraging. We have Rebecca Slaughter, Commissioner from the Federal Trade Commission. <laughs> Dr. Melissa Omino, Director from Swarthmore University Center for Intellectual Property and Information Technology Law. <laughs> and just to keep you on your toes, we have Wendell Wallach on the far end. That's not Wendell, that's Wendell. <laughs> okay. He's from the Carnegie Uhuru Fellow of Artificial Intelligence and Equality Initiative from the Carnegie Council for Ethnolog Ethics and International Law. And last but not least, we have Julie Wong, Chief Executive Officer, Hong Kong Consumer Reporting Council. Reporting in progress. With a stack fan group in the audience. Have your, has your head been spinning? <laughs> My head has been spinning from the talk about AI. Let me just run you through a few things that have happened starting today, but then the last few months. So just today, if you peeped at the New York Times, I know we're in Nairobi, also look at the Nairobi Times. But in the New York Times today, our nation's losing the global race for AI harms. Just a couple of days ago, we saw that, well, not a couple of days ago now, in November, the UK had an AI safety summit beginning of November. Then we had publications from Brookings, a very credible institution, talking about AI and the global south, the potential and the potential harms. We also had the United States White House issue an executive order, order on safe, secure, and trustworthy AI. We have the European Union that issued the AI Act, the first of its kind. In the draft, there was an oops. It did not include chat GBT. In May, my very own organization, I forgot to introduce myself, I'm Dion Woods Bell from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. My own foundation issued principles and guidance on AI, focused on co-designing inclusive, responsible AI that builds ac equitable access. And not to leave any vulnerable population behind, in March, UNESCO, together with the OECD, launched a report on the effects of AI in the working lives of women in the lives of women. Well, today we want you to go on a journey with us to try to better understand the benefits and the harms of AI. We want to think together about the possibilities and we want to work together to prohibit, to get rid of the harms. Let me start with a lightning round for our panelists. We want to ask you, why should consumer advocates, regulators, and other stakeholders care about AI? What's new about it and why should we care? First over to you, Commissioner Slaughter. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dion, uh, and thank you so much to everyone for having me here. It's such an honor and a privilege to be in Nairobi. Um, uh, why should consumers and advocates care? Because this is a technology that's present in all of our lives already, many times in ways we're not even aware of, uh, and I think will only become more so. I think it's worth noting for those in the audience who are not familiar with the alphabet soup of acronyms of US agencies. I'm from the Federal Trade Commission, which is the independent US agency responsible for prohibiting unfair and deceptive acts and practices and unfair methods of competition. So we do competition and consumer protection enforcement, mostly concerning domestic commercial activity, um, but it has real implications for how we participate in a global economy. Um, and many of the things that we'll talk about today in the AI space, I think very much sound in what has been the heart of the FTC's work, looking out for real people and how they pr participate in markets every day for over a century. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Dr. Melissa. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope you can hear me. Um, if you can hear me, you can just say hello. <coughs> great. Javier can, can hear me, so that's great. Um, I think that, especially in the African context, why consumer advocate groups should be concerned about um, uh, generative AI, like ChatGPT, it's because of the level of the consumers that we have, right? We need to think about the vulnerable people that we have as consumers from the African context, and that's really affected by many things, including socioeconomic reasons, geographic reasons, the digital divide. So the, we have these types of consumers having access 
to technology, emerging tech such as ChatGPT, and we need to understand how that is impacting this type of vulnerable consumer. So at CIPIT, um, part of our research in the area of AI policy is to look at the African AI ecosystem and look at the different stakeholders in this ecosystem. And everybody talks about the developer and big tech and, and government. And it's very rare for people to understand that consumers are a major stakeholder. And that's why advocacy groups should be concerned. Well, all right, thank you. Over to you, Dylan. What do you think? OK, thank you very much. Um, I think that everybody has a consensus about technology. In actual fact, it's quite neutral. It can bring about benefits to consumers. But on the other hand, you know, every day we are seeing um, the potential harm and also actually harming consumers already. Uh, on the benefit side, uh, two major ones that I keep mentioning uh, in the press. One is about uh, more efficient uh, provision of service to consumers, uh, like uh, the chat board, voice board, or maybe personalization as well, because you know me far better than you. Uh, I know myself. So this is uh, the uh, general benefits you know, that uh, uh, generative AI can bring to consumers. But on the other hand, you know, every day, we observe you know, quite some uh, detriment already. Um, just name it about uh, uh, the wrong information. I remember the fact that you know when uh, ChatGPT first launched in the market. Of course, you know as a consumer advocate, I immediately tried it out and searched Gilly Wong, Hong Kong Consumer Council. All right, but turned out to be half right, half wrong. So if consumers have no knowledge about uh, the information, you know that can be easily be treated. This is very fundamental. Other things you know that always happen in the um, in the press is uh, deep fake. Defect is uh, even more harmful to consumers. No matter it's voice, text, images, if it's defect, it is far less easy for consumers to identify it, especially you know, the cognitive nature of AI um, in its ability. So I think it is really a matter for every one of us because we are consumer protection agencies, safeguarding consumers. And don't forget the fact that it is the consumer who pay for the service who pay for all these services, but on the other hand, it becomes very reactive. Even though they embrace it, they want to use it, uh, but on the other hand, you know, they have hardly on an individual basis to protect themselves, so that's highly reliant on us you know, to be their voice and safeguard their interest. Um, and I think, you know, uh, as mentioned by Dion just right at the beginning, there are lots of global movement already right now, uh, very exciting. But is this fast enough you know, to safeguard the interests of consumers? What is the right thing to do and the most efficient and the transparent way to handle it? I think there will be a lot of discussions. And it will not be stopping here. It will be the beginning of all the discussion. Thank you very much. Wow, Jilly, you have a lot on your mind. I know the audience is right, riding along with you. Uh, Wendell, please um, illuminate. Uh, what are you thinking about? Well, thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me here. I think the self-driving car gives us an apt metaphor for what this inflection point in human history is. Technology is moving into the driver's seat as a primary determinant of human destiny. And over the next 10 years or so, we're going to make decisions about how much control we maintain over that destiny and how much we're willing to surrender to the technologies, and probably just as importantly to those who control those technologies. So it's little more than a year since OpenAI introduced ChatGPT. And in that year, actually within a few months, it became the fastest adopted technology of all times, much faster than cell phones, much faster than any other technology we have witnessed. And that speed's probably due to a couple of things. One is, it's a relatively easy technology to use. And secondly, people saw real benefits of it. So hundreds of millions of students realized that within a few moments, a brief question into their computers, they could get ChatGPT to return their assignments for them for school. Now, maybe they learned a little bit from the organization of the assignment by ChatGPT, but they probably didn't learn very much about how to think or how to learn. And again, let's stay with the young people here for a moment. Uh, so many of them aspire to be songwriters. And within a few moments, they can ask ChatGPT to compose a song in the style of any of their favorite stars. And it will do a modestly decent job of that. Maybe not good enough to, for them to claim it as their song, but at least it serves as a creative pop. 
So we're seeing that. But we're also seeing that since it can do many of these tasks so quickly, it challenges the livelihood of those who have been doing some of these tasks. If creativity becomes so easy for a machine, or if a machine can steal all these elements, then what is the role of the creative artist in our future? And where, how will they be remunerated? And if it can fulfill so many jobs, how will the people who fulfilled those jobs in the past be remunerated? But I just want to focus on one other element before surrendering this. One of the fascinating things about ChatGPT and why we all seem to be sitting here for the first panel of this very august meeting is that it not only alerted people to its benefits, but it has alerted the public to its risks. And nobody really understands very clearly whether those risks are, can be managed, whether it's just the short-term risks of gender biases, whether it's long-term risks about ex existential risks to humanity, or whether it's what I consider the more serious risks, which is the exacerbation of inequality and the surrender of tremendous amounts of, of power to the tech oligopoly. So in this vast array of expanding risks that have been posed to us with AI, let me focus on just one. Scams, misinformation. We're all subject to them. I can usually spot them fairly well. 20 years ago, they were largely all from Nigeria telling me I could realize a, a million dollars that had been unclaimed by somebody. But today, it's becoming more and more difficult to understand what is a scam and what is actually real. So imagine that 12 months from now, you get a video from somebody in your family, sounds like them, looks like them, and they're pleading for you to send them some money within the hour. How are you going to know that that's a scam? How are we going to know that's a scam when most people can't figure out the difference between a real voice of a person and the simulated creative voice of a person? So I'm just going to throw that out for the beginning of our discussion here. Thank you. Thank you, Wendell. There's so many issues that were brought to the fore with that. Um, I think, you know, you went to Happy Talk with creatives. I know the FTC recently had a roundtable looking at the, with, working with the creative community and thinking about how you can work together. Um, I'm bullish on the technology because I believe in the hope and potential and the promise. Think about the potential for economic growth, for healthcare, for education, so many things. But we have to be cautious about the harms. Commissioner Slaughter, can you talk to us a little bit about the potential harms, and can you talk to us about the pathways that consumers might have for redress and recovery? Thanks, Dan. I really appreciate you mentioning our uh, AI and the Creative Economy Roundtable. It's available on the FTC website, and it's really worth a couple hours of your time to watch it. I found it, myself, deeply fascinating. We had creative professionals writers, actors, musicians, web designers, um, all talking about the different ways AI is affecting their work. Um, not all negative, but many very challenging, and they pose a lot of problems, some of which are within the FTC's ambit and some of which are without. I think the first point I want to make is we talk a lot, we hear a lot about this transformational technology and all the ways governments around the world are trying to think about new legislation, new regulatory approaches to deal with it. And I think the first important message I have for other regulators and for advocates is it, we may end up with new laws. That's fine. We do not need to wait for new laws to pass to use the laws that we have right now to address the actual problems people are seeing in the marketplace. I mentioned earlier that the FTC operates under a very broad general statute. Um, it's similar to many consumer protection and competition statutes around the world. And the, we have used these tools over the last century to adapt to what challenges uh, our consumers are facing in the marketplace, whether as consumers, as workers, as small business owners. Um, and I think making sure we're paying attention to all the ways in which these technologies affect 
real people's behavior in the market is important. Um, let me mention just a few of the ones that we're focused on. We heard a little bit from Wendell about fraud. That's a huge one. Combating fraud has been an important part of the FTC's mission for a long time, and we're already seeing the ways in which AI can turbocharge fraud, scams, impersonation, deepfakes. Um, another one I worry about is uh, marketing claims. We talk a lot about what this technology can do, but a huge source of scams are people claiming it can do things that it cannot do. Um, and we have been charging companies with illegally marketing products for decades and decades. Uh, this is just another flavor of that. I will tell you somebody, there is a person who routinely, many people routinely email me trying to get the FTC to, uh, uh, thinking I'm the procurement officer for the FTC, which I'm not, wanting us to adopt their technology. But one person keeps emailing me, telling me that we can use his AI technology to detect whether our employees are likely to be criminals. And this is a bad idea. <laughs> for, to, to, it is a bad idea for him to email me for several reasons, so I just forward it to our, um, marketing practices department and our um, ad practices department and say, this seems like some marketing claims that we might want to look into, because it is not at all clear to me that they could be accurate. So looking at those things are important. Um, uh, I heard Wendell also mention the potential of exacerbating inequality, and I think that's another area of focus for us, the ways in which AI tools, either based on the data on which they're trained or the ways in which they're deployed, can um, exacerbate unfair outcomes, particularly towards underserved, already underserved populations. Um, and then I also think it's really important that we think about the competition bottlenecks that are possible in AI. Um, if AI tools are being developed and deployed by large gatekeepers, that can have a huge problematic impact on innovation and the growth of new business. And this is where we think about the positive potential for AI and wanting to see new businesses come to market with the best ideas and not be withheld from markets by a few large gatekeepers. Uh, and I mention that because I think uh, we often think of competition as outside the realm of consumer advocacy, but I love the energy that consumer advocates right now are devoting to making sure our, we have competitive markets. Fair markets means not only free of frauds and scams, but also honestly competitive. So I think that's an important part of it. Let me just mention quickly how we're dealing with this at the FTC. So we are making sure that we are using our full panoply of tools in our toolbox to address the problems we're seeing in the market today and those emerging for the future. So that means case-by-case -case enforcement against companies that we think are doing any of these problematic activities. And I'll mention one case. We had a settlement with Amazon over how it was collecting data through its Alexa devices. Um, we alleged that it was illegally collecting children's voice recordings in violation of the laws that we enforce. And we require them to not only delete that data, but stop training models on it. And I mention that because it's an important way in which a consumer protection violation could be used to have a negative competition effect. If companies illegally collect data to train models, that hurts consumers, it also hurts competition. Um, in addition to case-by-case -case enforcement, we're doing a bunch of rulemaking. We cannot, by rule, address conduct that isn't already illegal under the FTC Act, but we can provide clear guideposts to the markets about what conduct is and is not violative, and I think that that's really helpful and important for businesses to be, a honest businesses, to be able to comply with the law. So we have an ongoing rulemaking around impersonation, which is obviously very relevant as we've talked about for deepfakes. We also have a large-scale rulemaking around commercial surveillance and data security. And I think the outcome of that, if we decide to move forward with rules, will be important in the AI context. And then finally, in addition to the uh, legal tools that we have, we're working really hard to make sure that our analytical tools are fit for purpose. We have stood up an office of technology We've hired a huge number of specialized technologists who can come in and make sure that we're really understanding what's happening under the hood with the, some of these products in the market. 
our agency has long employed not only attorneys and investigators, but economists to help us make sure we understand the economic effects of market practices. I think today having technologists to help us understand the technological backbone of the practices we're looking at is equally important, and expanding that analytical skill set has already been paying dividends for us. Thank you very much. Um, you've covered so much. I want to just drill down a little bit and maybe circle back to you on, uh, sorry about my throat, um, the fact that you mentioned the Office of Technology. We're sitting in front of uh, many amazing consumer advocates, and I think there's a real opportunity to think about technology together, to think about the training, the potentiality, and to bring resources in that way. So I just want to link, leave that out there, and then let's come back to it, and you guys come back to us with questions about it. Dr. Melissa, I know you're a positive woman. <laughs> <laughs> you have this idea about you know how you can use technology for good. Mm -hmm. Tech for good is kind of your middle name. <laughs> so can you talk to us a little bit about the benefits of AI and how you think consumers can benefit? Sure, I can talk about that. And please forgive me or indulge me because I'm looking at it from the African context and specifically a Kenyan context. You don't need to ask for forgiveness Thank you. in Africa. We're talking about Thank you. Um, so I think I look at it in two ways, um, in terms of the positives of emerging tech such as generative AI. And the first thing I look at that, uh, the first lens is accessibility. And this is really exciting to me because at CIPIT we speak to AI, local African AI developers. And the one thing that they talk about is the lack of African context data, right? Because data is what drives AI. And right now there's a large um, discrepancy in terms of language data. So the African local developers are doing a wonderful job in going out there and creating local language data sets. An example of such developers are Masahane who are doing that, and there's a group such as Ken Corpus who are also doing that to really get the local language data sets on board. And what will that help with? If you have a chatbot, for example, that is developed by a third party, maybe to be used by government or to use by businesses, then um, people can access these services and businesses in their local languages, which helps with accessibility. So that's one positive that I see really with, with generative AI. The second one is about predictability. Now, it's not often that you have predict, like predictable business practices or models. We all know that, right? A middleman will show up. Um, something will go weirdly wrong when you're trying to purchase a thing. But with models, we know that they have a process from beginning to the end, and they are going to deliver a service depending on the data that you prompt them with. So this helps with predictability, especially in the African market, that you know that when you're using this um, AI tool, that it's going to get you to your end goal. So those are the two positives that I have um, about that. Dear, you look at me like I should say something more. <laughs> <laughs> I know you have lots to say. <laughs> so those are the two positives. But I do want to caution that the positives are balanced or um, have to be balanced with the training data, as, as has been mentioned before, and the bias in the models, right? So questions that we're asking ourselves in the African ecosystem, who is developing the algorithm that is actually delivering these services? Is it being developed in Africa by Africans? And is it solving an African problem? Or is it solving a problem for somebody else using the African market? So that's a cautionary, cautionary tale that I have um, in terms of this. The second thing is, as much as we are saying that there's accessibility, that is also tempered with the digital divide that exists as well. And so you might find that you will need to do a little bit more work in ensuring that this accessibility actually functions as a positive. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Well, um, you, you, you really helped us understand African realities and potentiality. And then you're not pie in the sky. You're grounded in reality. So I appreciate you bringing that. Um, Jilly, you think a lot about data and how AI is dependent on data and what does that mean? And what about responsible use of the data and the responsibility that goes with creating these types of models? What do you think about policymakers and consumer advocates? Uh, how can they center on these issues? Well, there are lots uh, we can do together, but let's go back to the fundamental about AI or Gen AI. What's this new trend? This new trend is data, as we all know. And the quality of data is very important because we all say the same thing, garbage in, garbage out. So this is 
uh, unknown fact. Yeah. But in the oceans of internet, in the oceans of everyday posting up every minute, uh, uh, deposting you know, information, um, how, who can assure the quality of the data? All right. So this is a very, very challenging task. But it doesn't mean that you know, we couldn't do anything because um, from the right regulations or maybe good trade practices, uh, especially when uh, lots of commercialization of proprietary Gen, I, Gen AI happens in the market, um, the quality of those uh, Gen AI will be very essential in uh, safeguarding the, uh, the interests of consumers. And uh, another point is about, uh, from the legal aspect, is the legal legitimacy of, uh, of those data. Because every day, you know, we talk about, you know, the copyright issue and things, you know, lawsuits. Um, this is another aspect, you know, that probably less from our aspect, you know, to concern, but more from the regulator, the IP regulator, you know, to concern about, but still, you know, affecting the quality of data. And finally, one important set of data is our own Gen AI data, our own footprint. Every day, if you misbehave, if you're too lazy or maybe too reliant on Gen AI, you are giving out so much you know, personal data or maybe so much about yourself or maybe about your organization to the Gen AI, it is also you know, not in your own interest. So um, for all in all, so it's very important you know, to start with while all the regulators and maybe different uh, stakeholders group are debating about you know, how to manage you know, Gen AI, very importantly is consumer education. This is something that every one of us you know, can play a role to behave properly, how we importate, uh, make good use of Gen AI, but without uh, sacrificing your personal data, how to mask it, what kind of tools you know, we can provide to them you know, to safeguard their, their own behavior. I think it is very, very important because no matter how great the regulations is, if consumers, they misbehave, they are just uh, too reliant on that, uh, they are not going, uh, good you know, to themselves. This is um, one point I want to make. And another point you know, that I think uh, can, can be considered, and actually is very important, is to have the right set of um, principles that can uh, be applied you know, across different um, scenarios and over different jurisdictions. The respect of cross-jurisdictional regulation is very important, but it cannot be uh, um, uh, the disparity you know, cannot be too high. So uh, it's very essential you know, to have that global dialogue to ensure that you know, consumers are very uh, highly you know, safeguarded. But one challenge probably to the regulator is, every one of us you know, will always you know, say it when talking about the enforcement, whether the regulator have enough resources and fast enough you know, to regulate it correctly, accurately, and uh, effectively you know, to safeguard consumers. That will be a big challenge to many regulators as well. And finally, you asked me about you know, what can be done by consumer protection agencies. Lots, you know, as I mentioned. First of all, I mentioned already, is consumer education. And the second thing you know, probably we have to do is we have to know it well, use it well, and be a role model to the public, to the consumers, so that you know, when they ask for your help, you know what you should do to support them. And finally, of course, you know, active participation in all those dialogue for the right advocacy is also really essential. So no matter it's OECD, WTO, or uh, the EU, or even you know, China, everywhere, you know, having very active you know, activities, but we have to participate. Even though if they don't let you participate, you have to step your foot in to ensure you, know, you are involved, to do whatever you could you know, to get involved. So probably you know, these are the advice you know, I can think of by far. Well, thank you. You've given us lots of words to think to live by. Um, I want to just think about this consumer education piece that you pointed out. The Competition Authority of Kenya has a consumer education module that they've been working with students on. And I know that the Consumers International have also been developing consumer education modules. So what would the world look like if we had these consumer education models and we scaled them and rolled them out and thought about them together with the fantastic consumer awareness campaigns that are launched at Consumers International and at all the agencies and with all you consumer advocates. Um, Wendell, I know you want to get in the game. Like you have a lot that you have on your mind, but I want you to talk to us about frameworks, international frameworks uh, that you think of that govern AI that could help us put some frameworks in place so that we can have some protections. And how do you, which ones are you thinking about? And how do you think uh, they could be strengthened? Great, well thank you for that question. As I think most of you have been observing this conversation about governance 
and governance in your own countries of generative uh, AI models, you've probably come to a conclusion similar to mine, which is there are some bright spots like the FTC, but there's also an absolute mess out there. A lot of competition about who gets to write those laws and how much they're controlled by the oligopolies that also already have the foundational models, the large language models that, that are being deployed about being deployed out there, and of course, the unevenness of what happens from country to country. So here we are in Africa, 52 countries. For many countries, the major political issue or major issue is really accessibility. According to um, the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, 2.7 billion people have no connectivity at all. So connectivity becomes a priority often on a state level, but it also should be a priority for us on an international level. My concern, though, is that we're getting into a strange territory in looking at governance problems. So we've now had um, the last speaker just was stressing for us the importance of data and data regulation. Well, a lot of people who look at the short-term risks of AI, I do focus very much on that, and I, I'm particularly concerned about gender inequalities, racial inequalities. They're also concerned about other near-term issues, such as the embedding of AI modules and control systems. AI is everywhere now. It's not just these discrete generative AI applications, and will be more and more ubiquitous as we, as we move forward. And the question is whether these systems really have the intelligence to make the kind of decisions that, that they are in effect being asked to do by, the, by being embedded in technologies, and whether they have that kind of accuracy. We know that generative AI systems make up information. We also know that they are subservient to those who want to misuse them for various, for various reasons. So the question is, is there any form of regulation we can put in place that is going to make a difference here? Now, for many of you, your national organizations, you're going to focus on the, the policies of your nation. But I, for just a moment, would like Conservation International to think about its potential role in this space to champion consumer rights internationally and to look at what we need to put in place to champion those rights. Now let's think about international regulation for a while. Don't think that the international regulations do much more, or the conversations do much more than give lip service to consumer rights. They're particularly concerned with existential risk, the use of AI in military applications, such as lethal autonomous weapons. And though there's a lot of talk about privacy and protecting consumer rights, there's almost no action toward putting treaties in place that would give anyone enforcement authority. And that's part of the broader problem we have with international governance today. We all understand that our international framework is teetering, and it can't always be relied upon. And it's perhaps time that we start putting in replacement mechanisms, models that perhaps can be within the rubric of the United States Nations for legitimacy, but become new independent ways to not only set standards, but put in place the possibility of some degree of enforcement for the standards we put in place. So, I mean, far be it for me who's new to your body to to put forward a proposal like this. But my suggestion is that you truly make, over the next few years, citizens' rights, consumer rights in the digital age, and particularly in this generative AI moment, a priority to put in place some international mechanisms, not only standards, but to try and forge new, forge new bodies. You may not have to do it alone. IEEE and other international groups will probably join together with you. But considering that some of the best issues that we might be able to start out with are clearly consumer issues. So just for an example, I'm going to put forward scams again. It's pretty hard for anybody to argue against scams. 
Almost everything else you propose, somebody says, oh, but this is good. We don't really want to regulate large generative models because that will put us at an economic disadvantage. That particular argument just pretty much brought down the EU's AI code in the last few weeks because the three largest nations didn't want to sign on to anything that might put them at a disadvantage in terms of innovation. In the United States, we have corporate capture. Corporate capture means that, in effect, the politicians can be bought by the corporations if they try and move forward with the legislation that the corporations really don't like, and they don't like governments having any control over the foundational models that they presently own. But there are issues, like quelling scams, that are international issues. These are not state issues. Why? I mentioned the case of Nigeria 20, 30 years ago when I got my first scam over the inter internet. This isn't about Nigeria, it's about somebody operating out of Nigeria. But the point is, scams can operate from anywhere in the world. Therefore, your national legislation means very little unless you put a massive amount of national infrastructure behind it. So you need to put in place an international structure, both to say that citizens' right in include the right not to be scammed, and particularly not to be scammed by digitally misrepresentative information that only is there to, to um, control your behavior, and that this is an internationally prosecutable offense. Wendell, thank you very much for that. Uh, Jilly wants to jump in and just do that succinct seconds. point. Because I want to call for support for all the consumer protection agencies in the room here, uh, because for uh, initiated by Australia and supported by um, New Zealand and also uh, Hong Kong and also which UK, actually you know, we are advocating for a statement uh, on anti-scam. So in case you don't know that, please have a look at that and sign up to support us on this global movement. And the details you know, can be found with Stefan and the digital team of CI. Yeah. Well, well you I... get broad support oh. for scams. We're going to jump in. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, just to keep the conversation no, interactive. Like that, yeah. um, I thought there were a couple of really interesting points there that were raised. Uh, I think Wendell makes a good point about the lack of accountability. And it's why something that we think about and is a very important principle for me is, uh, there is a, a researcher at MIT, he used to be in the Obama administration, his name is David Edelman, and he said several years ago, AI is not magic, it's math and code. And remembering that, and remembering that there has to be human accountability for the decisions behind the development, the deployment, the use of AI, is a really important thing for all of us, to remember that there are humans on either ends of these decisions. I thought, Gailey made a really interesting point about resourcing and consumer education. Um, I recognize that the FTC is probably the best resource of the consumer um, enforcement organizations represented here today. And I will tell you, we are still grossly under-resourced. I mean, we feel every day how uh, much more demand there is on our time and our staff and our workload than we are able to meet. And I know that that is doubly true for many of the other organizations here. So um, I will just say we think a lot about how to make each thing we do as effective as possible. That means thinking a lot about deterrence and sending a strong deterrent message in our enforcement actions and applying human accountability, including individual executive accountability in our cases to make sure that there is an incentive for corporate managers to take responsibility for compliance. Um, and I wanna both endorse and also push back on the consumer education point a bit. I think one way we can all be really effective is helping people develop digital literacy and understand how not to fall prey to scams to begin with. That's an incredibly important service. It is also important that the burden not be on the consumer and on the individual to avoid scams in the first place. We want to help them, but I'm really concerned about a model where we we focus so much attention and energy in education, and the result of that is it creates an impression that it's everybody's responsibility to avoid scams themselves, not the responsibility of the companies who are perpetrating them or the platforms who are facilitating them. And I think that we need to 
we need to take a balanced approach to doing meaningful consumer education without um, burden shifting in a way that is really unfair. Exclamation point, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, really, I really like that last point um, because when I think about it, the consumers in my sphere are very vulnerable and it's, it's already a, a task for them to get to a point where they're actually utilizing this tool to ask them to be knowledgeable about how they're utilizing it is a bar above. I think that there are efforts though that I'm seeing within African local developers who are coming up with communities of practice where they're coming up with codes of conduct themselves about how they will develop these tools and how they will interact with consumers. And I think that's a great place for consumer advocates to tap into in terms of collaboration. If you could collaborate with these uh, communities of practice by developers in order to get um, get them thinking and taking a little bit more accountability and responsibility with that, right? Um, there was also something mentioned about um, power and dynamics, and I really think that that's an important conversation to have here, um, especially in Nairobi. And I want to really um, commend the African Union to, about thinking about a um, policy. They're talking about AI policy at an African Union level. They, they've also talked about data policy framework at the African Union level. And I love that because when we talk about AI, honestly, we're talking about big tech, right? Um, African local developers are really solving small, minuscule problems. And the bargaining power from African nations and big tech has never been fair. But if you band together as the African Union and tackle that, I think that's a wonderful place to start. I love your idea about a pan-African approach to these issues and the broader vision about how you balance between educating people and also holding big tech accountable. Can we open the floor to, to those of us in the room who might have questions or comments? what you have said, so I don't want to repeat what you've said. I am Felicia Monye, uh, Professor of Law, Investor of Nigeria, and President of Consumer Awareness Organization. Uh, my, my question, uh, my brother, is on original research. I'm in the university system, and we uh, emphasize originality a lot. So the question is, the effect of the gener uh, generative AI on independent research. Because the way I see things now, or the trend that we see, you see uh, researchers seeing solution even before the course. You've not started the research, and you want to start a research, the uh, first step is to go to the internet, to see what is there, to see what you can generate through AI. So what is the future of independent research? So my, my, my contribution here is that the policy makers must take into account copyright issues, must take into account legalizing issues. Because just because you have data available, you just go there, get what you have, and what you have may, may, may uh, just narrow your focus may narrow your focus, but if you start the research from an independent perspective, then by the time you finish, you, you will be able to get something that is original, and that original contribution will be your, your contribution to knowledge, and that is the only thing that will qualify you for your research, either the master's degree or PhD, or whatever research you are doing, project research. But this generative uh, AI, fine, because it, it makes uh, uh, data available, it makes the information available. But then, I, I just see this problem of lack of zeal, of reduced zeal for independent research. So please, the lawmakers and policy makers should look into this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Felicia. And for those of you who don't know, she's the author of the first consumer protection treaties in the Republic of Nigeria. She's a, a really famous author and has been at this game a long time. So she's saying, do the work, don't just lean in on the computer and click a button and think you have all the answers. 
Good, good morning. Euh, je m'exprime en français via la traduction. Euh, Paraît-il que d'ici euh, 2025, on aura. C'est Dr. Zebdi, président de l'organisation algérienne des consommateurs, chez Algérie. Euh, Paraît-il que d'ici 2025, euh, 95% des, trans des transactions et interactions avec euh, le consommateur se feront par des canaux utilisant l'intelligence artificielle. Euh, ne pensez-vous pas que, en tant que mouvement cons consumériste qui euh, tente de protéger le consommateur, qu'on est dans l'obligation de mettre en place au moins une charte d'éthique commune et universelle. Voilà, c'est la question. Merci. Okay. Okay. Je parle français un petit peu, donc so <laughs> je pense que j'ai compris, mais je pense que la question était est-ce que nous pensons que c'est une bonne idée d'avoir un code universel de l'éthique pour l'AI Oui Oui, ok. Um, c'est très bien fait, madame. Merci. Nasema Kiswahili Kidogo Kidogo. Also. Um, Merci. Yeah, I think it's an important point. Uh, code of ethics has been at the forefront of a lot of the conversations about AI for a very long time. And I think it's um, really valuable and really important. Where I get concerned is that a code of ethics, which tends to be more sort of voluntary commercial commitments, displaces legal obligations of the developers, users, and deployers of AI. So I think both things are important, but I want to make sure that the idea of sort of voluntary codes do not stand in the place of meaningful law enforcement including along the lines of the laws that we already have today. Thank you. That's powerful. Yeah. Wendell. Yeah. So, I mean, actually there are codes of ethics. AI ethics has become a very big field over the last three or four years. There have been perhaps as many as 200 different codes of ethics put forward, but most of them are pretty similar. They overlap, they, uh, they talk about privacy and transparency, and uh, a number of other AI-specific concerns, but they also sometimes talk about human rights. Uh, the Beijing Code, for example, does not talk about human rights, but it talks about the time-honored concept of harmony. So there are these codes of ethics. Two of them have been vastly endorsed, and that's one from the OECD, and the other one is from UNESCO. So they are large bodies of countries that have signed on to them. The problem then is that AI is moving into every facet of human life. And what do these, these concepts mean when applied to particular fields? So now we are in the operational stage of AI ethics, which is, is moving and thinking through what do those mean in terms of standards for different fields. So the IEEE is working on standards, for, for AI ethics, I, ISO has, other bodies are doing the same thing. But I agree that if we don't put in place some enforceable mechanisms, it's going to mean very little. There's, all, there's an awful lot of talk about corporate self-regulation. It's an illusion. We have gone through 50 years of experimenting with corporate self-regulation. We have case after case where we can show the corporations made commitments that they didn't live up to. And just as we have greenwashing, where corporations want to look like they care about the environment when, when perhaps in totality they're doing a lot of damage to the environment, we now have AI ethics washing, where corporations mask their concern with the ethics but behind the scenes, they may, they may work to undermine laws and regulations that would actually demand that they lived up to those commitments. So it's a, it's a kind of delicate period as to whether a code of AI ethics is really going to be substantive. And again, that comes back to my charge to you. Here you are. 
this representative of community, this representative of consumers across humanity. And if you can work together and demand that these national code, these international codes of ethics are truly embraced, that they are truly part of consumer rights, we have a prospect of creating a consumer-centric force which can outweigh all the power that the corporations have at the moment. Thank you, Randall. Uh, I think I have something to supplement. Um, I think all of us you know, have spent quite a lot of time in viewing different, different codes of practice, principles, guidelines, no matter which country from, from what international organizations. They are pretty much similar, or maybe they're difference in wordings, but the spirit by itself is very, very similar. And um, uh, it's all about transparency, privacy protection, uh, disclosure, you know, things like that. But one question, you know, from a consumer protection agency's point of view is, have it been cascaded down to the consumer level to make them feel it, touch it, feel good about it, that you know, all these codes and principles, reports, uh, paper, really safeguard my interest. I think you know, there's still quite a gap in between, and that's why you know, we have to work together, and on the one hand, to, uh, to continuously improve you know, the discussion, but on the other hand, all those high-level principles has to be boiled down to the benefits of consumers. For example, have all the e-commerce traders have disclosed their AI policy on their website for ease of reading by consumers? Have they disclosed about their privacy policy? Have they disclosed about their ever from on a responsible basis? Have they ever you know, have a dedicated office taking care of AI in case of any disputes? There are dedicated people you know, to look after that. I don't think you know, that many organizations are doing it right now, no matter it's international level or at the regional or even local levels. And this is something, you know, from an upstream to downstream point of view, you know, we have to drive for that to make sure that, you know, whatever is at the top level, boil down back into something that is touchable, tangible for consumers to feel it, and that gives them the confidence of using Gen AI or AI, you know, at the end. So this is what I want to supplement. Thank you. That's really powerful. And thank you to the Honorable Chair from Algeria for bringing that to our attention. We have these global initiatives, and if they're just high-minded global initiatives without real impact on the ground, they're meaningless. And so that's, that's really the bottom line. Uh, who has the next question on this side? Sorry, we can't hear you. While she comes with the mic, okay, go ahead. Good morning. My name is Professor Chisun Mboka, Consumer Advocacy and Empowerment Foundation in Nigeria. And what you said about grassroots is extremely important because I find out working with the grassroots, they're clueless. They're clueless on the impact and they're clueless on their actions because it goes both ways. Not only from the manufacturers, the producers, the coders, but also the fact that the person on the street really doesn't understand their actions or lack of actions. So even putting it on a website, without bringing it down to the level of the elementary school, that speaks to their parents, the secondary school, the tertiary institutions, that understanding has to really trickle down all the way down to that level. Otherwise, this becomes a conversation, we gather, we visit the big five, and we go home. But it doesn't still get down. And the responsibility, yes, it is on both ends, but we, have, we cannot forget the grassroots. We can't forget. And that's where the organizations have to work with, whether it's the producers, whether it's the companies, but you have to work with those people who are closest to the grassroots, because that's where that information trickles down to. Thank you. We got two more questions, and then we're going to have to wrap. Uh, 
Good morning. Uh, thank you for uh, the organization of uh, this uh, global congress. Professor uh, Nadalani from uh, Lebanon. I'm the vice president of Consumers uh, Journal. The reality is uh, the AI is a benefit to all the consumers around the world, the world. But our responsibility as consumers organization to develop a new idea to protect the personal information of the consumer during the use of AR. So we can, as a power and press, all the companies that develop all the program to develop a security program in parallel to be safe when we use. So for any application when we don't download, we need to put all the information for us. It's not secure. So anyone can press or can open our information, telephone number, email, or something else. So the company will be developed fast without any security for the consumer. So we can, as consumers organizations around the world, develop a regulation, a special regulation, to protect the consumer in this idea. And we can develop in this Congress a recommendation for all the consumers to be pressed on the governmental or regulation system in the country. Thank you. Dan, can I respond? Please, yeah. I think it's a, I think it's a really great point about um, that reads on the relationship between data protection, consumer protection, competition, technological development. Um, and I would like to encourage, in addition to the idea of a collective advocacy position, I think inter and intranational cooperation between regulators who have historically been in different spheres is very important here. The FTC is very well positioned because we do consumer protection and competition, and we are functionally the US's data protection regulator. So we have it all in-house, and it still takes skill building for us to think across our agency um, to have these conversations. Um, I would like to make a plug for the international cooperation piece of this among regulators. I think um, it, it is a really important opportunity to share information, share best practices, and even coordinate on specific enforcement actions. Um, and then the last point I wanted to make uh, was in response to the previous professor from Nigeria about the grassroots um, access. I think you're absolutely right, and the digital literacy point in particular is key. But also, I do not want us to turn AI uh, grassroots access into another sort of click-through consent form farm. I think we've all seen that that's not a great way to get information to people on the grassroots. Uh, I think about it as a parent. I have four children, um, and I'm pretty digitally literate, and I cannot be responsible, uh, even if I didn't have a full-time job, for every way they interact with technology every day. Uh, and if I can't manage it, probably very few people are well positioned to manage it. And so I think, again, about Digital literacy, yes, but burden shifting to make sure companies are treating their users responsibly in the first instant, rather than just making them consent to unfair uses. Well, thank you, Commissioner. I'm told we have to wrap. Um, maybe you can come to the front and ask the panelists after it's over, because they're going to pull us off the stage. <laughs> we'll close with just this. Who believes that the risk of AI are tremendous, like they're, they're, they outweigh the benefits. Who believes the risks outweigh the benefits? This is a windowism. Nobody believes the risk. Who believes the benefits outweigh the risk? At the same level. At the same level. Who, who believes, who's, who's undecided? Okay, in a poll all around the world, uh, Wendell says, because Wendell, Wendell says, um, that this is the outcome that we would get before we even started the discussion. I want to thank you all for joining us here on this panel, and thank you for putting up with my voice that just disappeared overnight. Uh, this panel is amazing, and you all are amazing. So many smart people, such a powerful place. Thank you, thank you so much to this panel. It's been incredibly informative. I want to tell you all uh, that we'll be taking a coffee break and coming back here at 11.30 to start the session. So please take a very quick uh, refreshment break. And to follow up on the themes 
discussed in today's session, I can tell you about two things that are happening tomorrow, both in the morning. There's a workshop at 7 a.m. on AI uh, standards, which is something that, that Wendell mentioned. Uh, that's being hosted by the Alan Turing Institute, I think it would be really interesting for many members and civil society advocates to be there. And what Gilly mentioned on the scam statement, if you want to participate and support that statement tomorrow um, at 9 o'clock, there will be a session on scams and fake reviews where the, set, the statement will be displayed and you'll have a chance to sign on to it as a, as a member. Thank you. Back here at Level Thank you. Thank you.